During my second trip to Chile, I visited a state housing project in the northern city of La Serena to meet some of its inhabitants and hear about the various neighbourhood initiatives they had set up. Such meetings are important because there's always a risk that government officials, with the best possible intentions, may assume that the only worthwhile conversations for me to have are with people who hold national power and responsibility. Thus, the entire country outside the capital city and the whole population outside the decision-makers and the experts can easily be overlooked. After our first meeting in the housing project, a particularly powerful-looking woman, who had given a passionate presentation about representing the views of indigenous people, asked whether I was working for President Bachelet. On hearing that I was, she strode purposefully towards me with a rather grim expression. For a moment, I wondered if she was preparing to attack me, but almost at the moment of impact, she threw her short muscular arms very wide and hugged me until I felt my rib cage bend the wrong way, making me promise that I'd pass it on to La Presidenta. Back in Santiago, I kept my promise, just a trifle awkwardly, the next time I met with President Bachelet in a heavily gilded salon in the presidential palace. A guard in 19th century dress uniform grasped the tasseled hilt of his polished sabre and stepped anxiously forward as I closed in on La Presidenta to give her the hug. I wondered a great deal why Michel Bachelet seemed to be so unaffectedly loved by many of the Chileans I met. When I asked, they would often tell me that it was because she was a real person. The question of authenticity and how we perceive it is a critical one when looking at politicians and other people in power. President Bachelet provided an interesting contrast to the British Prime Minister Tony Blair, whose speaking voice changed from one that was startlingly ordinary, just like a real human being, at the beginning of his time in power, to the familiar false cadences of the professional politician in a very brief space of time. Those false cadences reminded me of an episode in Oliver Sacks's book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Sacks describes a visit to his hospital's aphasia ward. Patients with global aphasia lose the ability to understand the meaning of words, but remain acutely sensitive to tone of voice and body language. Sachs came across a group of patients roaring with laughter as they watched President Reagan addressing the nation on television. Sachs wrote of, quote, The feeling I sometimes have, which all of us who work closely with aphasiacs have, that one cannot lie to an aphasiac. He cannot grasp your words, and so cannot be deceived by them. But what he grasps, he grasps with infallible precision, namely, the expression that goes with the words. Thus, it was the grimaces the histrionisms, the false gestures, and above all, the false tones and cadences of Reagan's voice, which rang false for these wordless but immensely sensitive patients. Unquote. If only we could revive this hidden but preternatural skill in voters all over the world, how much better we would all be governed. I was struck by the essential modesty of the Chileans and their so-called chaquetero, or jacket-puller syndrome according to which anybody who achieves success or prominence can expect to be pulled down, by the coattails presumably, by everyone else. The Chileans were convinced this characteristic was unique to them, and yet I've found it, or versions of it, in almost every country I've worked in, with the notable exceptions of the United States, Sweden and Kazakhstan. Now, that would make an interesting thesis. Most of these countries even have, like Chile, their own often untranslatable expression for it. The Japanese say that the nail that sticks up gets hammered down, whereas in Australia it's the tall poppies that get cut down. In Scandinavia it's the law of Jante, named after a fictional Danish town in which nobody ever stands out from the crowd. In fact, this tendency for societies to value modesty and conformity over exceptional achievement appears to be the norm rather than the exception. Another common fixation relates to hospitality. In almost every country I've visited, my hosts tell me that hospitality is what they're uniquely famous for, and with the slightest encouragement, will even produce medieval accounts to prove that it has been so for centuries. And indeed, I've found it to be the case almost everywhere I've been that people are remarkably welcoming to strangers. This has become an in-joke in my family. When I come back from a trip and they ask me how it went, my invariable answer apparently is, the people were lovely. 